Well, hello. Good morning. Thank you for being here in the morning in Miami, getting to campus. For some of you who are coming from off campus, and for those of you who maybe came to campus a little bit early, we are glad that you are here today. Welcome to our first lecture of the 2023-2024 academic year. My name is Nathan Hiller, and I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Leadership, and I'm also a professor in the College of Business. Um, just a bit of history. The Leadership Lectures were established in 2011, and to date have brought more than 46 distinguished and world-renowned speakers to FIU and our community. And of course, today is no exception. I would like to thank, before we get started, our partners who helped make this possible today. The FIU Foundation, the Chaplin School of Hospitality and Tourism Management, as well as Startup FIU. This has really been a shared and collective endeavor. Today, we host Jeff Hoffman as our feature leadership series speaker. Jeff is an award-winning global entrepreneur, proven CEO, worldwide motivational speaker, best-selling author, I'm not done, Hollywood film producer, a producer of a Grammy award-winning jazz album, and executive producer of an Emmy award-winning television show. That sounds grandiose, but it is all true. In his career, he has been the found founder of multiple startups and has, was CEO of both public and private companies. You know how you check in at the airport uh, at those kiosks? Jeff invented those. Jeff has been part of a number of well-known startups, uh, also including Priceline, Booking.com, and UBID. He is also the chair of the Global Entrepreneurship Network, which works with entrepreneurs in 190 countries and is a founding board member of the Unreasonable Group, whose 289 portfolio companies raised $6.6 billion in funding. And he is the managing partner of Jeff Hoffman Advisory Services, uh, as well as a host of other things. And he said, keep this intro short because I've got a lot of stuff I want to say. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Jeff Hoffman. All right. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks, man. You didn't tell me it was distinguished speakers. I guess none of the distinguished people were available, but I was in Miami today, so you guys have to listen to me. Um, we're going to talk about just a handful of the things that it requires to be a successful entrepreneur and a successful leader. Um, and just so you guys know, uh, I didn't start with any of this. Um, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in a small town with a single mom who had four kids and three jobs. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I said yesterday, the tribute to my mom is, uh, I didn't even know I was poor until I went back there and I said, wait, we were this poor? Um, because my mom didn't focus on that. Um, so we started with nothing, had nothing, except I will tell you guys uh, one thing, which is I always had big dreams. And by the way, nobody ever believed in any of my dreams. I spent my whole life getting laughed at and hearing the following, what is wrong with you? Why can't you just go get a job like everybody else? And the answer to that question is, I didn't just want a job, I wanted a life. Um, and that bothered me that people were willing to accept, you go to college, you go get a job, and then you just slave away, whatever, to pay your bills. It just didn't seem like that was enough. Uh, but I'm just telling you, in case any of you feel this way, nobody believed in me. And when I would tell people my big dreams, they would just shake their head. So for those of you who don't have support, it only takes you. You will find support, but don't let all that negativity around you. The reason that we use today's term, the reason that you have haters, they don't hate you. What they hate is to see you succeed because it makes them feel bad for not trying. So a lot more people want to see you fail to make themselves feel better. And if I had listened to all that negativity, I would have never started any of the things uh, that I'm about to tell you guys about. So I'm going to start by telling you this instead of a job, right? Your career should be, literally should be, the vehicle that takes you to the life you want to live, not the obstacle that prevents you from living it. Let me explain why I say that, and that's what we're going to talk about here. I, <clears throat> I have a new definition of success now. And success, we're raised to think that success is money or fame. If someone drives by in a Bentley, you're like, whoa, he made it. 
And if you see someone on TV and she's famous, you say she made it. And yet, literally, I have billionaire friends who are miserable. And I have very famous friends who are miserable. And then I have friends who have no money, no fame, and they're the happiest people I know. So let's redefine success. You might have money and fame. That's not the point. The point is success is defined by anybody, this is just my definition, who can stop at any moment in your life, look back and say, man, this is a pretty good ride. That's it, guys. It's not rocket science. We want you to love the life you have, not wish you were someone else, right? We live in this country, especially with all the celebrity uh, hero worship. Why don't you design a life that you look at and say, I actually like my life. I don't want to be someone else. I want to be me. That's the only definition of success that matters. So to do that, you have to first know what is it that would make your life epic, right? And I actually write on white index cards. And I challenge you guys to think about it. I love when people share them. I write the next thing, something I want to do with my life so that when I look back, I'll say, eh, time pretty well spent. You'll make mistakes. You'll get things wrong. And you'll have bad moments. But in the end, I want you to nod and say, I actually like my life. And I don't touch it. I like the way things are going. So to do that, you have to know what would make your life epic what would make you happy. And what I hear all the time is people that say, when I ask them what their dreams, when you were young, what was your dream or your vision of an epic life, right? And then later I talk to them and they're like, dude, at some point you have to grow up, right? They said, you know, you have a job, you have a mortgage, you have a family, all these things. And people tell me, I don't, all my dreams, that was all great when I was young, but now I have a job and a mortgage and a family or whatever. And they tell me all the time, Jeff, at some point you got to grow up. And, and believe me, if that's the definition, I hope I never grow up. Because what I think when people say you got to grow up is they're not growing up, they're giving up. And what I don't want you to do is give up on an epic life. And the only reason people will tell you that is because you need to go get a job and pay your bills, okay? Your job and your career should be the reason you have an epic life, not the obstacle. That's a really important message today. So let's talk about that. I challenged myself when I was young, I asked myself, what would make me look back one day and say, that was a pretty good ride? And so this was it for me. I grew up in this small, poor town in the middle of nowhere where no one ever left or did anything. And I was like, man, I want to see the world. So the first thing I ever wrote on, the, on a little card, and by the way, I stick them on the bathroom mirror so that every day I can't hide from it. Every day I see in my bathroom mirror, when I start and end the day, something written on there, and I ask myself, man, are you, are you really doing this, or did you just grow up and you have a job now that you don't even like, okay? So that's step one, decide something you want to do. So at any time there's one of these cards until I finish it on my bathroom mirror. Uh, it's pretty cool because people all over the world now send me pictures of the white index card that's on their bathroom mirror. Actually, I had to let one girl know, uh, don't do it while you're standing in your bathroom right out of the shower naked because you're in the mirror. This girl sent me this picture. I was like, someone's sending me porn. I was like, oh my God, she just took a picture of her bathroom mirror, but she doesn't know that she's in it. So make sure you take it at the right angle. Um, that was what was on my mirror. And I will tell you guys that I had an even crazier dream, right? My dream wasn't just, I'll, I'll tell you where this came from. It came from a Mark Twain quote that I read in, in school to do a book report. And Mark Twain said, travel is the fatal enemy of prejudice. And I was like just lit when I read that because I knew it meant something to me. And what Mark Twain was telling you was that hate, right, comes from ignorance. Ignorance comes from lack of understanding. A lack of understanding comes from never spending time with people that don't look like you. So I was like, for me to become the man I want to be someday, I need to get out of here. I need to go see the world. So I had this seat. When I told people I was going to visit 50 countries, everybody laughed at me. You know what they said? Dude, you're broke and your mom's broker, right? You ain't going anywhere. And people accept that. Just go get a job. I'm just telling you, I didn't accept that. But you know what I didn't tell them? You know what my real dream was? I was going to have, to make my life epic, before I die, I'm going to have dinner. I'm going to break bread with 50 families in 50 cultures in 50 countries. Believe me, I told no one that because they already were laughing at me. That was my dream of an epic life. If I can look back one day and say, I talked my way into 50 homes and 50 cultures and ate dinner with 50 families so I could be in their house with their kids and their life and understand people, right? How are you judging, let's use the common example, how are you judging Muslims if you don't even know any, right? I'm not going to make a comment until I've been in a Muslim family's home in their country with their children breaking bread. That was my big plan. Um, but I will tell you guys that I did go get a job 
because everybody was telling me, just go get a job. I was a, I'm a software engineer, that's my degree. And I went and got a software job, and I sat in that cubicle every day and hated it. Now, nothing, there's no right or wrong. I'm not telling you not to get a corporate job, anything like that. This is a DNA thing, not a right or wrong thing. You should follow your DNA, but mine, I couldn't sit in there. By the way, I know well, someday when I die, they'll do the autopsy, and they'll cut me open, and they'll say, that guy's DNA was 99% sarcasm. So you can imagine how well that works in corporate America. I was in trouble 100% of the time because I couldn't stop the sarcasm in my boss. None of the bosses like that. Um, so I did leave. But here's the first thing I'm going to tell you uh, that's the key to success for an entrepreneur, but it's also your ticket to the epic life, which is solve real problems in the world. So many people, everywhere I go, people pitch me stuff. But so often, people say to me, Jeff, check it out. I built these, whatever it is. And I was like, OK, who wants one of those? And they say, I don't know, we'll see when I start marketing it, right? You come up with an idea you think is cool, you start marketing it, and you hope somebody will buy it, buy it. Or you can do what the world's most successful people do, which is instead of complaining about a problem and then going back to what you were doing, fix it. So here's an example. This is my friend Lars. Lars is not American, by the way. He's from the little country of Denmark. He's Danish. Lars was sick. This is back in the day of paper maps. Lars was sick of being lost all the time. And instead of complaining about always being lost, he couldn't read a paper map. I can't read them. I actually used to have to try to fold them back up. I would just like throw them away and get another one because I couldn't fold them. Um, Lars one day was sitting there on the side of his car lost. And he's like, I'm sick of being lost all the time. But instead of complaining right, and going home, he's like, I don't ever want to get lost again. I'm going to figure this out. So my friend Lars, by the way, he was lost. He was looking up at the sky, like, you know, maybe praying for help. But when he looked up at the sky, he got an idea. What's in the sky? Satellites. If they can see me, they know where I am. And if I tell them where I'm going, can a satellite tell me how to go, where to go? My friend Lars created Google Maps, not Google. He solved the real problem. Google bought this from Lars for $1.1 billion. Lars is living a very nice life now because he solved a real problem instead of complaining about it. So, Nathan, you kind of blew my punchline here. <laughs> but um, I had that job I told you guys about, my corporate job, that I, I just hated it. I just didn't have, people would tell me, get a good job with a good company and a good salary. My mom told me that. My mom was all proud of me, telling her friends, my son's a good boy. He has a good job with a good company and a good salary. But the thing no one asked me is, do you have a good life? Because a good salary doesn't give you a good life, even though everyone told me that. But I'm telling you the truth. I went and got a good job at a good company with my software engineering degree, and I had a good salary. And my mom said, he's such a good boy. And every day I stared at the clock and thought, this is it. If I'm going to spend the rest of my life in this, this, right? I don't even get. One day I was thinking, I can't believe I honked at a car in front of me so I could get here faster. Are you kidding? I should have let everyone in the city go in front of me. I didn't want to get here faster. So I'm going to tell you guys what happened. Because that thing on my bathroom mirror said visit 50 countries and have dinner with 50 families, I was like, I don't even visit the top floor of this building. I don't even go on the elevator. So I quit, and I walked out. And then everybody was mad at me. I'm 20-something years old. I'm broke. My mom's broker, so nobody's going to feed me. And my mom's calling her friends. Remember I told you my son was a good boy? He's not. He's an idiot. He quit his good-paying job, and now he's broke and unemployed. And I went to the airport with the last money I had to buy an airline ticket to go see a guy that was not my mentor, but I was planning to camp out and talk him into mentoring me. And I, the line was an hour and a half long, and I missed the flight. And while I was standing there, everybody was complaining. So the key to leading an epic life is fix a problem that everyone else is complaining about instead of inventing some new idea that you have that nobody has ever even asked for. So while I was sitting there at that moment, I was like, wait, this is my moment. And this is why I told you about the thing on your mirror. What do I want to do? I want to travel, but I don't have any money. My friends would say, Jeff, there's no job where your job is. They're going to, someone's going to pay you to fly around the world. And you know what I thought? You're right. There isn't a job, so I will just create that job. What I want you to do is design your own future and create it. There was no job that was going to let me fly around the world. And I was like, man, I'm just going to make that job. I'll just make that company. Which, of course, like I told you guys, not one person told me that was a good idea. So that was the moment. I went home, solve real problems, and design a business that lets you lead the life you want to leave. My dream is to travel the world, and here's a real problem. I'm standing in the airport, and everybody's missing their flight. So I went home that day, 20-something years old, broken, unemployed, took out a paper, 
and I designed these. And today they're in every airport in the world. But you know what my job was? Monday morning, Lufthansa would call, could you come to Germany because we want your kiosk? And I was like, seriously? Right? And then KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, can you come to the Netherlands because we want your kiosk? And the crazy thing was, I'd go to a new country, I'd get to see it, I literally talked my way into some family inviting me over for dinner, those were some good stories for another day, and I was living my dream, and at the end of each one, they'd say, Mr. Hoffman, don't forget your check, and I was like, my check, and they're like, we want to buy your kiosk, and I was like, wait, you're paying me to fly around the world, I thought that couldn't happen. You design the life you want, don't accept the one that everybody else is okay with. I created this company, so now, I want to tell you an important thing about how you do that. And by the way, now you should be less surprised that we built Priceline.com and Booking.com, right? Because what were we? We were people that wanted to travel, but you still have to be a grown-up and pay your bills. When I told people I want to go pursue my dream of travel, people told me it was irresponsible. You got to pay your bills. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you about chasing your dreams. If you solve a real problem to do that, I'm not here to talk to you guys about money. You can sit in that. You just tear a little reserve thing off. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> um, I'm not here to talk to you guys about money, but everyone was telling me you need a job, you need to pay your bills. That company, uh, have any of you used either Priceline or Booking.com? Somebody tell me you're a customer in here. Okay, thank you. Now I feel better. Um, the, uh, we started that company on a little table. Remember, I grew up as a broke kid of a single mom in the middle of nowhere. I had no money, no, no, I didn't have what you guys have. I didn't even have a school like this. I didn't have a leadership school or classes. I didn't have entrepreneurship or business classes. I was just making it up as I went along. And that company today, uh, Booking.com, I, I feel always silly saying this, is worth $113 billion, and we started it on a coffee table. Anything is possible, and anyone can do it. Solve a real problem. Here's the second thing. And solve a problem that helps you get where you're going. Win a gold medal at one thing. I see all these things, these speakers talk about multiple streams of revenue and all this kind of stuff. But let me tell you something. The people that built the most successful companies in the world did that by focusing on one thing. So people forget, back in the early internet days, um, the first three internet companies that actually made money uh, were um, Jeff and Pierre, who were building eBay, uh, the other Jeff who was building Amazon, and then we were building Priceline. Amazon, eBay, and Priceline were the first three internet companies that really started doing business. Actually, it's funny because I was talking to some reporter, and uh, because I knew Jeff at, at Skoll at uh, eBay, and then Jeff Bezos at Amazon, and we were building this, she said, what do you need to do to be successful on the internet? I said, apparently just be named Jeff, because that's going pretty, <laughs> it's going pretty well for the Jeffs at this moment in time. Um, I used to talk to Bezos all the time. And here's what people forget. Jeff's plan was for Amazon to be the internet of everything, but for seven years or something, you could only buy books. And I said, Jeff, what's the deal? And he said, before I do anything else, I'm gonna be the best damn bookseller on the planet. Okay, and that resonated with me. And my other friend, Tony Shea, you guys know this company? Tony created this company. And Tony eventually intended to sell handbags and earrings and other things, but he said, first I need to become the best damn shoe seller on the planet. Winning a gold medal is becoming, is being recognized for being the best at something so that the world believes in you, right? So we were going to sell, I don't think I have, I do. We were going to sell vacations and we were going to sell cruises. But I listened to Bezos. He said, you need to be the best damn something. And I was like, what is the one thing we're really good at? We're actually good at hotels. We don't really know cruises. So we don't really know vacations, right? We actually have airline tickets on there, but it, you, you will notice something. Our gold medal is hotels. Find one thing you can be the best at and do not do anything else. It is not, you don't start four businesses with four completely different products. The key to success is not being the one-stop shop for everything. We don't sell luggage. We don't sell travel insurance. We'll just book your hotel. If you've ever seen a Priceline or a Booking.com commercial, all we ever sell is hotels. And what's crazy is, after all the people telling me, you need to have all these multiple products and lines of revenue, we only have one product, hotels, and we're the world's largest seller of hotel rooms. The company makes like, 20, sell $20 billion a year, and we only have one product. So win a gold medal at one thing, and do not take that advice that you gotta be selling everything to everyone. That is not the path to success or growth. Next thing I wanna tell you 
These are, by the way, my terms, the, the gold medal, is I want you to think about, um, I want you to find your gold medal talent. And let me explain what that is. What is the talent you have that's better than everyone else? So let me give you the example of it. Priceline and Booking are travel companies, but our talent, none of us were travel agents. I didn't work in a hotel. Our talent is algorithms. The reason that the company is in 190 countries now is because we wrote these, now you call them AI, these intelligent learning algorithms that every hotel company in the world said, you guys get us more money for our hotel rooms than our people do. Your algorithms are smarter than all of our revenue managers. So we're really good at writing algorithms. So why am I telling you that? Because when a business opportunity comes up, if it doesn't need an algorithm, I won't touch it because my gold medal talent is writing algorithms. So you don't need an algorithm to sell a suitcase. So I'll never sell suitcases or luggage. You need an algorithm to optimize the revenue yield on a hotel room. I had this conversation with Jeff Bezos and he didn't use my word gold medal talent. He said, you know what we are? Our gold medal talent is delivery, Amazon. So why was Amazon the first company ever to try drones out for delivery? Because they're a delivery company, that's their talent. Why did they invent Prime? Because they're a delivery company. Same day delivery. When Jeff bought Whole Foods, I said, uh, why are you buying a grocery store? He said, I have no interest in groceries, but nobody has figured out how to deliver them. Find your gold medal talent. What is the thing you're best at? And make that be your North Star. Don't say yes to anything that doesn't require your gold medal talent or you'll just be average at everything. This is probably one of the most important lessons I can teach you. All my friends, we're always chasing money. And everybody's always talking about, today in your culture, you have a show called Billions and there's a song, Wanna Be a Billionaire. Everybody was always focusing on that. In the entrepreneurship world, they use this word exit strategy, right? Of how you're gonna get out. And when people talk about exit strategy, I'm always like, what's your entrance strategy? What are you exiting? You have a PowerPoint, and now you're already shopping for new cars? That's what I see people do. Chasing excellence, I never had an exit strategy. I never thought about money. I never worried about money. I worried heads down about excellence. And I was the one of my friends that always got paid. If you don't create something amazing in the world, you're not gonna get paid anyway. Stop worrying about money and focus only on excellence. Whatever you do, create the most amazing version of it you can and you will get paid. I mean, I'll, I'll use a 305 story, um, Armando. Uh, Pitbull is a very close friend of mine. And never in his life was, does his story include, I just wanted to be rich. His story was, I wanted to create music that people absolutely loved so they'd want to hear me. He focused on delivering an excellent product to an audience that wanted to hear it, and he got rich because he did that. But never in his story will tell you I was just trying to get rich. He'll tell you I was trying to get good. Chase excellence and not money. Um, I, oh, I was going to show you... Uh, just quickly, we used that formula, right? Everything I told you, what are the things you wanna do with your life um, that'll make your life epic? So I always have these, these note cards on my bathroom mirror. So the travel thing worked out, right? Today, I've, had, I've been able to break bread with families in 120 countries, but the crazy part is I get paid to do that, right? It's all I ever wanted to do, guys. And if I'd listened to all the people like, that said, just go get a job, and no one's gonna pay you to do that, and blah, all the blah, 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 I would have never done that. Like I said before, uh, haters are people that don't want you to succeed because it makes them feel bad. They don't even care about you. They're, quote, hating you, but they're just hating themselves, okay? I didn't listen to any of that stuff uh, to believe, I, I always believed that this was possible. Um, so I took that formula. What would make my life epic? Well, my, one of my passions is music. And so I took a break from tech and I told my friends, uh, mu entertainment, music, film, and television. And at one point I said, I'm gonna go out to Hollywood and make a movie. And they're like, are you nuts? You're a software engineer. And let me tell you this, everybody's answer was 98% of all independent films are never gonna be in a theater near you, okay? But here's what entrepreneurs hear. When somebody said to me, 98% of all independent films will never see the light of day, I was like, whoa, wait, can you get me the phone numbers of those other two people? Because two people figured this out and I wanna talk about them. Never think of yourself as the 98%. If your assumption is, yeah, I know, only two people made it, I'm just gonna be one of those two. That's the way I always thought, I just stopped saying it out loud. Because everyone was saying, dude, what part of 98% failure rate are you not hearing? You're gonna do this anyway? I'm like, 
two people made it, and I thought there was only one chance. It's already twice as good as I thought it was going to be. So I went out to LA. I wanted what would make my life epic would just go through the experience of making a movie. Um, this is the first movie we ever made. It's still on Netflix. It's still on Hulu today. It's not a good movie. However, we wrote this. We shot this. We directed it. We're all in it. That picture is my partner. The guy in the middle is a guy named Eli Roth. Eli had never made a movie. I had never made a movie. He's, they kill me in each movie, so I don't know if you can see that. I'm bleeding from a head wound before I die right there. Um, we wrote this, shot it, produced it, directed it. We filmed it in the, in the woods in North Carolina. I financed it, and Eli directed it. We're all in. It's not even a good movie, but we're good business people. I'm a marketing guy. Uh, so I was able to get this. It opened uh, in 3,000 theaters in the U.S. I sold it in almost 50 countries, made this for $1.3 million. And again, I'm not here to talk to you about money, but the movie made over $100 million. Um, my friends uh, don't watch it because they don't want you to hate me. And if you tell my mom I made a bloody horror flick, I'll be grounded for life, I guess. Um, the... Uh, but my friends would say, how'd your little movie go? And you know what I would say? Fine. I actually felt bad telling people that it did really well because everybody said it'll never work. You're a software guy. Uh, we started a TV company because every time I watch a show, I wonder what it would be like. How cool would it be to see behind the scenes and produce it? Um, and as Nathan mentioned, uh, I just won my second Emmy Award uh, for television production uh, for a show about defining success for your generation because your definition of success is completely different than what I was raised with. That's the show we just won our second Emmy for. Um, and then my real passion is music. So I told my friends, I'm going to go. Are you taking a picture of that plant, Manny? Because that's weird. <laughs> uh, OK, dude, I just you look like you're taking a picture of a plant. So whatever. I'll, I, if it came out well, send me a copy, all right? All right. Um, the, uh, uh, so we started the music company because I love music, and I saw a band going on tour, and I was like, how cool would it be to be on the tour bus? What I'm teaching you is dream big and go for it. If I fail, I can get over it, right? Because I can say it wasn't meant to be. But the thing worse than failure is never trying because you will spend your whole life. Imagine if I wanted to produce a concert or a tour and I never tried. Every time I go to a concert, I'm going to sit there and wonder if that could have been me. That eats you up from the inside. Failure, you get over. Never trying stays in your gut forever. So I said, I'm going to launch a music company. You're like, dude, you're a software engineer. I said, I I'm just going to try, see what happens. And the worst case is it's a good story, and I'll learn something. Studied the music industry, launched a company to go do tours and concerts. I can't sing. I definitely can't dance. But I can produce business events and market and sell them and finance them. I did the part that was my gold medal, the part that I could do. These pictures are embarrassing. Some of them happened before some of you in this room were born. Uh, but in the lower left, uh, we did NSYNC. We did Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys. That's me on tour with NSYNC in the day. We kind of had a cool little reunion. I don't know if you guys saw it. They got back together for the first time in 20 years. Actually, I was talking to them last night from the hotel here because the, the new song they just released for that Trolls movie was the highest a new song has ever debuted in Billboard history. And they haven't produced a song in 20 years. So last night, everybody was congratulating. Uh, that picture is when I did uh, produce concerts and tours with Elton. This is me and my assistants with Beyonce. We did a tour and went on tour with Beyonce. So I took a few years and went off touring. And, and now, as I mentioned to you, uh, Pitbull and I work together on a lot of business and charity adventures. Uh, ventures. But here's the craziest part. Um, uh, after all that, we produced one album. We like jazz, and nobody likes jazz or respects it. So we went in the studio, and we made our own jazz album. And the insane part of it for a software engineer is this is me on the Grammy red carpet uh, when I won a Grammy. Um, <laughs> by the way, if you can see what I'm doing, I'm taking pictures of all the paparazzi, because it's so stupid that they're all taking pictures of me. I'm like, why would anyone want to take my picture? And they're yelling at me, you can't take the pictures. I was like, clearly I can, because I'm doing that right now. There was a funny moment. The, uh, and then I'll go into the last part of my talk. Um, there was uh, all these paparazzi were yelling, uh, Jeff, how does this feel right now? And I said exactly what was in my heart. I said, this is the dream of software engineers everywhere. And they're like, what? And the little dude to my right with the headset, he's holding my name, right? Because the person to the right of me, right, just to the right of him was Madonna. So they all knew who they was. And I'm walking down the red carpet because we just won. They don't know who I am. So he's holding my name on a little board um, that says producer. But he leaned over and he goes, dude, you're killing the vibe on the red carpet. I was like, whatever. I'm talking to myself anyway. Um, that moment never happens. 
You know what else I have written down one day? I wrote this. Everybody always tells me my big dreams are impossible. By the way, my dream was never to win a Grammy. That was random. But my dream was to focus on excellence. And I told the guys in the studio, they said, Jeff, no one's ever going to hear this music. And I said, that's OK. Play like you're trying to win a Grammy. So it was insane the night before the Grammys when we were all in Hollywood having dinner. And they're like, dude, you remember the last thing you said to us in the studio? And I said, no. And they said, you told us to play like you're trying to win a Grammy. You know what I'm telling you guys? Do everything in your life like you're trying to win a Grammy. You, statistically, we won't always win a Grammy. You know what I mean. That's the metaphor. But if you do everything in your life that way, it's just way more fun. It's more fulfilling. And actually, you might just win a Grammy. Who'd have ever thunk that? Um, those were the things that I wanted to do with my life. My point of telling you that is when I said I'm going to start a music company, everyone said, you're a dreamer. You're a fool. You can't do it. You're a software guy. Go get a job to pay your bills. Turns out when you go on tour with NSYNC, you can actually pay your bills. That actually worked out pretty well. Um, our business was successful there as well. Um, now, here's the last thing I want to talk to you guys about today, especially because we're here in the Leadership Institute. So, so let, me, let me back up uh, a little bit and just summarize again uh, before I move into this last part. Um, the first step is to define the life. I don't care how old you are, right? Anybody in this room, even if you're my age or older, there is still at least one thing left that if you could do that, it would make your life epic. So this process never stops, no matter how old you are. You just ask yourself this, what is something I want to do that I'll look back and say, man, that was a good ride, OK? That's our definition of success. You always have one. What I'm telling you to do is write it on a card and stick it on your bathroom mirror so you stop hiding from it. So every day, the intent is in your head of what you're trying to do with your life. That's why I quit my horrible job. I would have never quit if it wasn't on my mirror. I would have just let another year would slide by and another year. And one day, I would have said, man, I never did any of that stuff. But I couldn't escape it because I have to look at it every single day. That's one. Then based on that, I want you to design a career that takes you there. I wanted to travel the world, so I designed a career in travel, and I created that opportunity. But how did, that, how did I succeed at doing that? By, by winning, by solving real problems is the first thing I told you. Don't invent stuff out of the blue. The world is filled with things people are complaining about. Go fix the thing they're complaining about. Another buddy of mine, by the way, he was in the car on the radio, and every time a good song would come on, we'd go, oh, stop there, good song. And then the next song would suck, so we'd hit scan again. And he's like, why isn't there a station where I like each song like, after each other? And there wasn't anything like that back then. And he's like, if I know what kind of music I like, can't there, isn't there something that could pick a song I'll probably like? So he went home to find songs that he liked, and he wrote some code for himself because he knew a lot of people want the next song to be something I'll probably like. And he never meant to release it. It's called Pandora, if you've ever heard of it. But he wrote Pandora for himself because the problem was the next song is never good. I want songs to be the kind of music I like. So he said, I'm going to write an app that figures out what I like and just pick songs I'll probably like. And now millions of people use that. Solve a real problem. Then I told you, win a gold medal at one thing. In your life, by the way, people ask me, but you did all these things. You did TV, film, internet, not at the same time. Every time I have a card on my mirror, I go do that thing and nothing else until I either fail, which, by the way, when people say you've done a lot in your life, I say, yeah, because I fail fast, because I don't waste time doing stuff that, I don't, that doesn't get me to the goal. right? So win a gold medal at one thing. Find something you can be really good at and be the best damn something. You don't have to be the only. There's not only one travel site. right? Um, there's lots of other companies that compete with Amazon, but he's the best. There's lots of travel companies that compete with us. We're the biggest. You just have to be as good as anybody. And then I told you to pick your gold medal talent, right? Which is figure out the thing about you that you absolutely rock at, right? And that's the thing that you should do for a living. In fact, I had that conversation. Pitbull and I were on TV doing something. And they asked me a question, and I explained it in like two paragraphs. And then he said like five words that said everything I said, but way cooler. And I turned and I said, thanks for embarrassing me on TV. And he said, well, dude, I am a lyricist, right? He said, the thing I do is write lyrics that are cool and they rhyme. I said, OK, that's his gold medal. He's a lyricist, right? Actually, it's funny because somebody asked him one day, are you a rapper? He said, no, I'm a reporter. And I said, how cool is that? 
He said, I just observe the world and then I write lyrics that explain it. He knows what his talent is. I actually know what mine is. Find yours and don't do stuff that you're not excellent at. And then we came to this. Um, this is the last part I want to talk to you about. And this is the leadership part. And what I want to tell you is that everybody talks about, everybody thinks the key to success for especially startups and businesses is funding. If I only add some money, funding, financial capital is not the scarcest resource and the most valuable resource in the world. The most valuable resource in the world is not money, it's talent, okay? Talent is the key to everything. Talent is the way, I'm gonna stick with that example. Talent is the way a Cuban immigrant in, the, in Little Havana in Miami whose father is in prison and his mother's an addict becomes Mr. Worldwide. Nobody gave him any money. What he did was he used talent. Talent is the key to everything. So if you are going to build success, it's not, don't use money as an excuse. I don't have any money, I can't start. I didn't have a dime, I was broke and I started, but I knew what talents I had. So your key to success is to surround yourself with talent. It's more important than money. Your key to success for leadership is Thank you for remembering the exact time. <laughs> I told him to alert me at 10.07, not 10 o'clock or 10.10. Um, I want to make sure I have time for Q&A with you guys, so I'm going to just wrap up this last part. Talent, so the key to success is not you. It's surrounding yourself with people smarter than you. As a leader, I thought my job was to tell people, I'm the boss, tell people what to do. That's what bosses do. I wasn't successful, so I stopped telling people to, what to do, and I left the office, and I went out in the world, and I found people way smarter than me, and then I just took really good care of them. The key to success is actually a servant leadership model. Your job is to find people way smarter than you, and then take really good care of them. That's the key, and it's about rock stars. You don't need to have 10 people. You need to find two rock stars, right? When people start a business and they have money, I was like, why don't you hire her? She's a rock star. And they're like, she's way too expensive. I say, so what you're going to do instead is you're going to hire five, I didn't mean to point at you when I said that, five average people. <laughs> um, uh, you're going to hire five average people because you can afford them and you won't hire her because she's too expensive. The key to success is give all your money to her and she will outperform five average people. Rock stars are the key. Rock stars don't find you, you find them. So as a leader, I'm out in the world all the time, constantly talking to people, and I was like, I've got to figure out where I could use this guy, because he's a rock star. Surround yourself with people smarter than you. Hire rock stars. I'm going to tell you a, a, a story that I told yesterday. Inc. Magazine asked me to write about leadership. And that's the title of my article. If you want to read it, it's on Inc.com, Inc. Magazine's website, under my name. But let me tell you the story. I'm on the road, and then we'll wrap up for some questions. I'm on the road, I just want you to understand what leadership looks like, because it's not what I was taught. It's not leadership is stands up there and tells everybody what to do. Um, real leaders don't create followers, guys. Real leaders create other leaders. People, this is funny, because people ask me now in your world of social media, you don't have very many followers. And I was like, that is not my goal. I'm not trying to create followers. And they're like, well, that's how you show your success or something. I said, if you want to see my success, go count the followers of all the people that I raised and mentor, right? When I work with people that I mentor and that I raise up and teach, those people all have millions of followers. That is my success. My success is when my team, when the people that I am raising become amazing leaders, right? So real leaders, I learned this the hard way. They're not looking for followers. They're not telling people what to do. They're creating other leaders. That's why you do this. So here's what it looks like. Um, I was on the road and my team called and they're like, Jeff, we met this 20 year old rock star developer. And I was like, you don't need my permission, don't wait, hire him. So they hire this 20 year old kid, rock star. I get back in town, I spend the morning looking at his work, the product he's designing. At lunch, I notice no one left for lunch. So I walk down the hall, because I'm gonna buy him lunch. I either want pizza, Chinese food, whatever. So I walk in the room, the 20 year old kid doesn't know I own the company, he doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know I'm the CEO. He doesn't know I own the company. We've never met. Um, and I walk in the room and I was like, can I get you guys something? And the 20 year old kid who's busy writing this, building this new product, glances over his shoulder, doesn't know who I am. And he goes, yeah, will you go pick up my laundry? And the, all the air sucked out of the room. I tell people it was like in a, a war movie when the soldier steps and you hear click and everyone knows he's standing on a landmine and everybody freezes. 
the whole room, they're all looking at me, oh my God, what is he going to say? And I said, yeah, where's the ticket? And he said, it's on my chair, and he went back to building the product, and I left. And a little bit later, I was outside, and my two vice presidents come running out, oh, Jeff, please don't hire him. He didn't know who you were. He didn't know. It's not his fault. Don't fire him, I mean. And they were saying, don't fire him, right? He didn't know. And I was like, wait, wait, calm down. Why do you think I'm going to fire him? And they're like, because you're so upset. I said, why do you think I'm upset? By the way, I don't get upset very much as a person. Um, happiness is a decision, right? You just decide whether you're going to let the world make you upset. So I don't get upset much. I said, like, why do you guys think I'm upset? They're like, because you stormed out of the building. I said, I didn't storm out of the building. And they said, then what are you doing? I said, I'm going to my car. And they said, why? I said, to pick up the kids' dry cleaning. <laughs> and they said, you're picking up, you're the CEO, the owner of the company, and you're picking up that 20-year-old kid's dry cleaning. I said, that kid is beyond rock star. I said, that kid is building a product that is going to win awards. By the way, back then, Silicon Valley had something called the ICE Award, Internet Commerce Exposition or something. It was, we won the award in Silicon Valley, and I actually got handed the trophy from Steve Jobs himself for the best new internet product. That kid designed it. I said, that kid is designing the most amazing product ever. So not only am I picking up his dry cleaning, but if you guys need me after lunch, I will be out back washing that kid's car, all right? <laughs> Leadership is about finding the people smarter than you and building a place that all the smart... Your job is to have all the best people want to work for you and never leave. By the way, when I sold that company, I had kind of a cool moment because my head of HR called me and she said, this is incredible. The TV reporter was like, Mr. Hoffman, your results are amazing. And she was read, we had 1,200% a year revenue growth. She said, revenues, profits, margins, all money. She said, all your results are amazing. And she said, what accomplishment are you most proud of? And while I was in the studio getting mic'd up, that my woman that ran HR called me and said, Jeff, I just verified something. This is really cool. I had to tell you. She said, from the day you started this company and all these years to the day you sold it, not one person that works for you has ever quit. And I was like, that's the single most important thing I've ever done, and I don't know how I did that. So I'm calling my team from the studio. I'm like, how come you guys never quit? And they're like, is that a problem? Do you want us to quit? I was like, no, but I didn't realize no one ever quits here. What is, the, what is it that I'm doing right, even if it's by accident? Why don't you ever leave? And I grabbed out a pencil, and I asked people, every job you've had you hated, or anybody that's ever treated in a way that made you feel undervalued and unappreciated, tell me about that so I can make sure never to do that, and then tell me all the reasons you love working here so I can do that again on purpose next time, right? That's what leadership looks like. Build the place where the best people in the world all want to work for you and never leave. And when I understood that's what leaders do, not telling people what to do, then I became successful. When I thought I was the boss, I wasn't getting anywhere. When I switched that pyramid upside down, that's when I had success. So I just wanted to share here in the Center for Leadership those thoughts on leadership. Our companies won because I always hired the best people. Why did we win a Grammy? Because I went out and found the best artists and people. Why did our other music company work? Because it turned out the product that we had with NSYNC was actually at that time one of the best, literally there was a moment that it was the biggest band in the entire world by numbers. We had the best product. We had the best team when we produced that thing. I have this slide that I used to show people. It's four singers. Three of them are waitresses getting ready for work, and one of them is Britney Spears on stage in Vegas when we were doing the Britney tour. And I said, if you rank these four singers in order of talent, Britney's fourth. Britney Spears is an OK singer. She's a really good performer. She's an OK singer. So why is she Britney Spears and the rest of them are artists, excuse me, are waitresses? Because we had the best team. We had marketers, we had, we had accountants, we had lawyers, we had choreographers, we had lighting people. We got the best people in every area, and when we rolled that machine out, she went all the way to the top, but she was just one of the players on the team. And credit to her at the time, no ego. Brittany would come up to work, and literally, like you were shortstop on a baseball team, and saying, do you want me to go out to shortstop and play my position? She came in every day and said, what do you guys need me to do? That's why she was successful, because she understood that a team of the best, a team of rock stars, is going to find a way to win. Talent alone doesn't make you win. Team does. Nobody's ever done anything really amazing on their own. Oh, I did have a slide that says that. A big piece of attracting people smarter than you is culture and values. Culture means whatever you do in your life, guys, lead with your values, right? So I, I will tell you that I, my values are on the wall, and I don't hire people's resumes. I hire a cultural fit. 
One of my values, in fact, if you do look at my social media, I posted a picture recently, and the picture of me, <laughs> I know this is silly, but it's me sitting with the king of Saudi Arabia, and the picture next to it is me with Maria, who is a Hispanic janitor in a company. And the point of that is, for me, those two meetings are the same. That doesn't mean I don't treat the king with utmost respect. It means that I make direct eye contact. I talk to Maria like she's just as important as the king. If you can't do that, you can't work for me. That's a core value. It's written on the wall. We treat all human beings with the same level of dignity and respect. Uh, it is the law of attraction. In my company, I don't care how good you are, how long your resume is, if you don't support our values, you don't work here. The reason the rock stars told me they like working here is because we are a company that leads with our values. So what I'm telling you is, in everything you do in your life, values first, right? That's why I said don't focus on money, focus on excellence. We got paid because we had values and we focused on excellence, we took care of our people, and we wound up being the ones that everybody wanted to do business with. Never once did I talk about getting rich, all my friends did, and we were the ones that got paid. Build a culture, live your whole life with your values first, and don't do people, again, I'll use the, the, the same example. When a new business opportunity comes up, the first thing that Pitbull and I discuss is, is this consistent with our core values, our brand? It's not how many million dollars that they put on the table. It's are these people that are brand consistent, that share our values, because if they're not, we're just gonna turn down the money. That is how you build success. So I want to uh, stop now, because um, we have some time uh, for some questions. I hope you have any. Thank you guys for attending today. Thank you guys for listening. I hope some of this was helpful for you. So we got mics in these in both aisles. Uh, who's got some questions? I mean, just tell us your name and then your question. That mic doesn't seem to be on. Uh, you can share a comment if you don't have a question. Uh, is it I on have now? A question. Hello. Okay. okay. Wow. <laughs> Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Garami, and I don't have much of a question, but I do want to share a story because um, you asked if you had any uh, customers here at, uh, from Priceline. I accidentally came across... No, I can't give you a refund. Thank no. <laughs> I know, you have to mark that. Do you agree to the terms? <laughs> um, anyway, I, I stumbled in an opportunity uh, in an airport in Honolulu, to do a one half marathon in every state of the United States. Wow. So a very expensive proposition. So I did come across to Priceline and I think Priceline could have been my sponsor for, <laughs> for <laughs> the race. Um, it's a great story. I mean, it has, I did not anticipate it. What you, can, you can, in the interest of time, so other people yeah. can ask it, you can send it. My email's there. Yes. You can send, you can send. I can send you the story, but what I want to say, I mean, I, I see Margie here. She took a picture and did a story here for FIU. Um, some of the students have been inspired by the race. Um, in terms of the evolution of, of Priceline, there was a time that you could actually bet on your, uh, the price of what you were going to pay on that. So that's how we la launched the company. The company was originally, you could make a bid. We were auctioning off empty hotel rooms. And that's how we launched the company. We patented that. We were the only people that are allowed to do that. You can still do it, but uh, people aren't as interested, so it's not the lead thing on the website. But that is how we built the company. Mm -hmm. Name your own price. You make an offer on an empty hotel room because uh, you can't afford to pay the full price. That is how we built the company. Okay. It's still there. It's just not the only thing anymore because you respond, you pivot with the market. Uh, not everybody was interested in that, and so it's there, but it's not as prevalent anymore. All right. Thank you for the thank, presentation. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks again. I uh, ran a half marathon cumulative lifetime, probably. So I'm probably up to a half marathon if I took all the times I've ever run in my life. You are a breath of fresh air. Thank you <laughs> Thank so very much for sharing with us today. I wanted to know what's left on your mirror. Um, on my mirror, there is one now. There always is. On my mirror now is, I mean, you asked, so I'll tell you, um, is to give uh, young people in the world that have no shot at a better life a shot at a better life. So all of my time now, I'm retired from that, is uh, spent with youth. I have my own youth foundation. Um, uh, last time I was here in Miami, it was pretty, pretty nice. Um, uh, Mark Anthony, the salsa singer, gave me a Global Humanitarian Award 
uh, it was here in town, but a lot of people around town stepped up to help us with this after Mark announced that thing. We find, start with abandoned children. We find, I'll give you a quick example. Mm -hmm. In Uganda, they had a civil war and all the parents killed each other and the kids were just left to die in the jungle. We went and got them all. I bought land, I built homes, we raised all those kids, we sent them all to school. In Ethiopia, the same thing happened, but there's not even schools, so we build schools. In Chicago, in Detroit, in Miami, um, we do the same thing. So that is my current thing on the mirror, is the kids that have no chance at a better life, let's do what we can to give them a path to get out of the life they have. That's what I spend all my time doing now. Uh, and it's way more fun than running businesses. Thank you so, for your gift you. to humanity. Hi, good morning, Jeff. My name is Angie. Um, I'm a graduate student here at the university and I'm also a staff member here as well. And um, that answer to your last question actually segues perfectly into what I wanted to ask you. Um, I'm studying higher education and one of the questions that I had for you is how do you feel like your education, I believe you studied at Yale, um, yes. prepared you for the entrepreneurial route that you've taken? Do you think that that liberal education that you received was kind of a pathway to allow I you to- That's an absolutely great question. Um, a side note, by the way, um, I wanted to go to Yale to study AI, which is ironic because it's eight million years later and AI is finally a thing. <laughs> um, uh, and I worked really hard to get in and I got accepted and I actually got kicked out the first day because we were broke. And uh, Yale's really expensive and we couldn't pay for it. And they said, you can't go to class here. Um, but I didn't go home. Um, I started a startup the second day of classes because I wasn't allowed to go to class. I started a company and I actually funded my entire Yale education and graduated in four years by running a business in the basement under the school until I got caught. Um, uh, because I was just running a business. Um, uh, in the end, they didn't kick me out for that either. So I did have a big educational goal, I just couldn't afford it and I didn't let, I'm telling you that, don't let everybody stop you, right? Because it's hard. Um, winning is hard. Uh, I found a way anyway. Um, I get people, especially young people that say, why do I need to get a, go to college? I'll just go start an internet company like you did. So every once in a while you read a story of a college dropout that started an internet company. The problem you're missing is the other 99 people of the 100 that were successful were successful because of their education. So if one guy makes the news because a college dropout started a company, 99 other successful people did it. Whose odds do you want, the one in the 100 or the 99? I, my education, to answer your question, somebody asked me that, some students at a school, it was I think a middle school or a high school that I was speaking at, and this is what I explained to them, that the reason that I was able to uh, start the music company is because my history classes taught me how to do research. That's how I learned research, and I researched the industry. The reason I was able to start the music company is because my English teacher taught me how to write up and present my ideas. The reason I was able to present my ideas is because I took a public speaking class as part of the gen ed things. Then when I was a CEO and we had problems and my team came in and said, there's a big problem and we can't figure it out. And one day I said, write it on the board. And I said, now break it into smaller problems. Now break those into smaller problems. Now we'll solve each of the little problems and work. They're like, how did you know how to do that? I said, my math teacher made me do that every time I was struggling. Okay, I, it is not, you don't, it's not the stuff it's not all the stuff you're learning in college. What you're learning is how to learn. My analytical thinking skills came from my science professor. So without my education, research, writing, analytical skills, problem solvings, those came from the breadth of classes that I took in school. I would have never been successful. I would not have known how to do any of those things. I am a strong believer in finishing your education before you do any of that stuff. That's why I was successful. Thank you for asking that. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good morning, thank you. I was very curious about all the naysayers and what you feel is your unique talent or ability to help shut out all of those naysayers. Um, the, the, uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you two answers. I know we're gonna run out of time. Um, the uh, shutting out the naysayers, um, what I always do is I envision the alternative. If I listen to them, by the way, one day in that cubicle, in that job I hated, my boss explained the strategy and he said, um, any questions? I said, I raised my hand, I was the only one. I said, I don't even know where to start. None of that makes any sense, right? And he looked at me and he said, does getting your paycheck make sense, Hoffman? And all my teammates were like nudging me to shut up. And I was so broke, I said, yes, sir, 
getting my paycheck made sense. And I just went like that. And I will never forget how I felt at that moment, right? I was an economic slave. I have to say yes, sir, because I need that paycheck. So every time the naysayers would tell me not to start, try something, I would say, okay, the alternative is I'm sitting back in that chair saying yes, sir, to that guy. I'd rather take the risk. Um, I've got to tell you another thing that is worth sharing. The other thing, that's, another thing that's written on my walls, I can't read that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, is written on my walls is, I wrote, I'll just tell you guys this, I wrote Upgrade Your Haters to VIP. And the story is, I said I'm gonna launch a music company and everyone's like, you're a software engineer, you know anything about music, it's a dumb idea, you're gonna fail. People way better than you haven't even been sick. Everybody was negative and everybody was a hater. And everybody said no. And then one day, when I'm on tour with Beyonce, my phone's ringing off the hook. And I answer it, and they're like, man, can we get tickets to the Beyonce concert? And I said, okay, you want tickets to the concert that will never happen, from the company that will never work, created by the guy who's a big idiot dreamer who's going to fail. Is that the ticket you want? And they're like, we never said that. And I was like, yeah, right. And I was telling this story at a university, and the student said, I hope you didn't give them tickets. And let me tell you something about haters. Um, I said, I didn't just give them tickets. I upgraded all of them to VIP. And what they had to do was call their friends and say, we're backstage at Beyonce. And their friend's like, how'd you get backstage at Beyonce? And they had to say, Jeff gave it to us. <laughs> and I was like, that is all I need to know. They are explaining to their friends, wait, Jeff, the guy you told me was a complete idiot, that guy gave you the tickets? Upgrade your haters to VIP, right? Don't let them win. Don't let them get to you. And in fact, it's just fuel for doing it. Thanks. So I tuned that out. But thank you for asking. Hello, Jeff. Nice to meet you. My name is Ricardo. I graduated from FIU last year, and I just started a marketing agency. It was a complete adventure for cool. me. Cool. Um, my goal is to help businesses portray the best of what your they do. Your goal should also be morning radio. I can hear your voice in the car while I'm driving <laughs> to work. It's another busy day in Miami. Do it, man. Another busy day in Miami. <laughs> 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 Wait, but my question is, um, how do I find these clients that I'm trying to help with the services that I do, basically web page and digital marketing? Um, how do I find quality customers, not customers? Okay, that that's a long answer, so you can email me. Uh, and I, just so you guys know, I do get to all my emails, but it takes me a while. Um, our, our nonprofit's on the ground in 200 countries, so I'm not in this one very much. So be patient, but I'd rather you email me because that's not a 30 second answer. Okay. okay. I can send you some info on that. That's a really good and important question, but we don't have time right now. All right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the inspiration. My name is Sad Kavasa. I'm a biology professor here, and I grew up in the middle of nowhere near the Amazon jungle with no services of any kind. And in no, where? Where did you grow up? In Colombia, okay. in the Janus region, and there, there were no schools, and there's still no schools today. But everybody has cell phones, and so you mentioned about building schools, but I was thinking, how about using technology to bridge in that? Education? Yeah, so a lot of the companies in our nonprofit that we support are building educate, basically school on a phone. That's happening, and we're funding it, actually. We're not the only ones. We're one of the people funding people that are building uh, schools on a phone for places where there is no school. So we completely agree with you. Uh, technology is another way to deliver education where there isn't a school. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, there's zero people over there, that's good. Uh, hi, thank you for coming to speak today. My name is Sebastian, uh, and I wanted to ask, is there, have, I'm sure on your business journey, there's been a lot of difficult choices. You've had to make a lot of sacrifices. When you have to make a difficult choice, what is your thinking process as you decide? Okay, so let, let, let's address the sacrifice one, because when I was in college, I told you guys I had to run a company uh, to fund my education, but I wanted that diploma. I wanted to graduate from that school, and I had no one to help me, so I was gonna get it done. So Friday night comes, everybody's like, dude, party, let's go. And I would get up, and I would stop, and I would say, why don't you guys go to the party without me, because I made a commitment to myself to finish this by Friday, and I'm gonna finish it. I'm telling this story on a college campus here in the US, and somebody said, so your advice is just to never go to a party? And before I could answer, a person in the audience, the guy next to him, grabbed the mic and pointed at me and said to his friend, no dude, the rest of that guy's life is the party. Now, I would never say that, but he's not wrong. You have to pay your dues. Nothing worth having comes for free. 
If you're not willing to sacrifice, then you're never going to have those things. So yeah, I skipped a lot of parties at points in my life so that I could spend the rest of my life doing, and again, I don't want this to sound wrong, uh, but doing whatever I want. Now I can fly around the world because when it was go time, I got it done and I skipped some parties. You will sacrifice to get what you want. If you're not willing to, you ain't going to get it. But in the end, all those people are the people, again, I don't want this to sound wrong, all those people are the ones that keep calling me and asking me for money. They want to borrow money. They need help. I was mentioning that I have like, I have multiple cars, but I don't know where they are because at any given time, someone who's down in their luck, I say, here, just take one of my cars and bring it back when you get a job or whatever. All those are the people that just partied the whole time. Take yourself seriously is what I'm telling you. I took myself seriously. I gave myself a chance to do that, and the payback comes at the end. Um, one of the other things written on my wall, everybody wants to be successful just till they find out what it takes. They're like, Jeff, I want your life. I say, you do, but you don't want to do what I did, right? That's make sacrifices. Thank you. I think we can only take one more. Good Tell morning me again, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, my name is Raphael. You know, I, we had a class yesterday. And your email? Is our no, the email you sent me. Did you read it? Uh, yes. You just made my day, dude. Thank you very much. I read the email you sent this morning, and that made my day. Thank you very much for speaking from your heart. I just want you to know I really appreciated that. I appreciate that as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I'm not sure if you're a spiritualist, but you mentioned dropping the ego a lot. Do you have any mantras or anything that you comes to mind when you need to just drop the ego when it comes up? Um, that's a good question. I don't. Um, I think that that is something that I learned more from my mother. No one taught me that. Um, it's just the way we were raised. Let me grab my phone and get out of the way. Um, so I don't think I really have a mantra for that. It's just that I would watch bad behavior, right? In the life I live now, I deal with a lot of people that have huge egos, and I don't want to be around them. They're, they're, it's just literally disgusting to me. So I think from watching bad behavior, I learned a lot of things. But I don't really have a mantra. If you come across one, send it to me. I wish I had a better way. Actually, you know what? We'll just ask Pitbull, Pitbull to write a lyric. Um, uh, one day, this was pretty good. One day, we were, we were talking, again, on a media thing. And I said, you know, hey, man, the sky's the limit. And after I finished this whole explanation, and Pitbull turned, and he said, I used to think the sky was the limit, too. But then I saw footprints on the moon. And I was like, really, dude? You have to do this to me again? We'll ask him to write a lyric on leaving your ego at the door. I don't have one, but it's important. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. If you don't have something to chew on after that, you were not here. Thank you very much, Jeff, for that um, engaging, inspiring. I think there's all kinds of nuggets that are going to be floating around in my brain. Uh, for the rest of the day and, and beyond. Really appreciate that. Um, we love at the Center for Leadership getting and having conversations with amazing people. Today was really a huge treat. I also want to cue you that for those of you who are interested in what's happening in leadership scholarship, we're going to have an event on November 8th. We have a leadership research colloquium uh, we have two amazing guests coming to tell us about what they're doing in the, on the research front, but in a very practical way as it relates to leadership. Some of you are saying, that does not interest me. Don't come. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, you don't need to. Uh, but it's, an, it's been an amazing thing where we have about 100 people come every single time we do this uh, and from all walks of life. So it's not a, it's not a for just for research nerds like me. Uh, but it's for everyone else. Uh, before we close, I want to thank one more time Jeff Hoffman for being here with us today. He, uh, Jeff will be floating around for a little bit. Please join us uh, in the lobby for a reception, and thank you again for being here today. <laughs>